Well, good morning, South Point Church. Always a pleasure and a joy to be with you. So I'd like to start off this morning with sort of like a chant or a declaration of truth. So if you wouldn't mind standing with me for a moment, just standing with me, repeat after me this declaration of truth. Living healthy, living healthy. is hard work. Hard work. Living, healthy living healthy is hard work. Hard work. Living healthy is worth the work, and with Christ, I can do the work. All right, now you gotta really convince me that you believe this. Let's say it this morning like we really believe this. Ready? Living healthy is hard work. Living healthy is hard work. Living healthy is worth the work, and with Christ, and with Christ, and with Christ, we can do the work. All right, high five the person next to you, fist bump this, says, we got this, we got this. You may be sit down, you may be seated. And that's what I'm talking about this morning, living healthy in a stressful world. Living healthy in a stressful world. We are living in a stressful world, a fast-moving world, a noisy world a busy world. And so this morning, I want to talk about this idea of living healthy in a stressful world. I'm going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 to 16, but we're going to look at several verses as we go through this theme this morning. But I want to start at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 to 16, where Paul writes these words to his young protege, his young mentee, Timothy, and he writes these words. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Don't let anyone, Timothy, look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity until I come. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, Timothy, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you, Timothy. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, Timothy, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, how many of you have ever had a mentor or a coach? Anyone? Yeah, lots of you have. And I do a lot of that. My wife and I do a lot of mentoring and coaching with couples, and I do a lot of that with leaders in business and sport and ministry. And so Paul is doing coaching. He's mentoring Timothy as he writes to him about how to lead well, how to love well, how to live well, how to pastor well. And he says, hey, Timothy, refuse to let anyone shame you because of your youth. Okay, you're young, but you're qualified, you're called, and, and God's favor is with you. Do not let anyone look down on you because you're young. Be an example, Timothy, in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity. Devote yourself to Scripture, to preaching, to teaching the Word of God. Develop your gift, Timothy. That is your responsibility. You've been gifted, but you have to cultivate it and grow in your giftedness, in your gift. Be diligent, Timothy, in these matters. Commit yourself to these matters. And then in verse 16, again, he says, watch your life, Timothy, and watch your doc doctrine closely. He says, this is a big deal. Persevere. That means to press on in this. Go forward in spite of obstacles and challenges and adversities, Timothy. Watch your life. Now, most churches are pretty good about their doctrine. Most pastors, most church leaders, most people in ministry are pretty good about their doctrine. Where we get sloppy and where it gets messy, how do we watch our lives? How do we watch who we are spiritually? How do we watch our lives physically? How do we watch our lives emotionally? How do we watch our lives in terms of relationships? How do we watch our lives mentally? How do we watch our lives? And Paul says, watch two things. Watch your life and your doctrine, Timothy. And I want to highlight this morning the watching of your life as we are called to live healthy in a stressful world. Health matters to God. Your health, your spiritual health, your physical health, your emotional health, your relational health, your mental health matters to God. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says this. Beloved, I pray... 
that you may prosper in all things and be in what? Be in what? Be in health, just as your soul prospers. John chapter 5, verse 6 says this. When Jesus saw him lying there, a man who was invalid, a man who had infirmities, who had some health challenges, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he asked this man a very strange kind of question. You would think because the guy is not well, because he's an invalid, because he has infirmities and challenges, you would think, why would Jesus ask him this question? But Jesus asked him the question, do you want to get well? Do you want to be made whole? And I get it. As a therapist, as a counselor, as a coach, I understand that not everyone wants to be made whole. Not everyone wants to be well. Some people, some of us, if we're honest, we get a lot of mileage out of someone validating our victimization, co-signing our dysfunction. We get a lot of mileage out of that because to get made, to be made well, to be whole means that I got to begin taking responsibility for my life. And it seems easier to continue to blame mama, mommy pain, and daddy pain, and first marriage, and second marriage, and third marriage, and, and, and to blame everyone else on why my life, why my story isn't working, versus me taking responsibility for my life and my story. See, that's hard work. That's, that's hard work. But it's worth the work, because you got to do the work. Proverbs 14, 23 says it this way. In all hard work, there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. You become spiritually poor, physically poor, emotionally poor, relationally poor, mentally poor, because it is hard work, it's hard work. In all hard work, there is profit, the Word of God says, but mere talk leads only to poverty. So what are the areas in our lives that we are to pay close attention to the words Paul gives to Timothy. Pay close attention. And there are five areas, five areas or, or, or domains of wellness. I like to think of them as domains of wellness that God says that we are to pay close attention to these areas if we're going to be effective in our work, if we're going to be thriving in business, if we're going to be and have an, an impactful career, if we're going to have a meaningful, thriving marriage, if we're going to burn out and not burn, and not, you know, burn, if we're going to burn on and not burn out, if we're going to reach our destiny and become the best version of ourselves through Christ, and if we're going to have favor with God and man, this is, these are five areas that we need to pay close attention to. And I've given you an acronym, PERMS, P-E-R-M-S. Now, if it was guys here, I would give another word, but PERMS works for today. Some of you will get that later on in a week. Like, what word would he give us? Okay. Anyway, but, but physical life, your emotional life, your relational life, your mental life, your spiritual life. Your spiritual life. And I found in my own life, in my own story, when I've neglected PERMS, when I've neglected these areas, my life has resulted in depression, in panic attacks, in poor health, in poor relationships, poor marriage, and poor everything. And I, I can remember like 17 years ago, uh, in my 30s, I was 39 years old, and I can remember when it first surfaced for me when I neglected these areas. It was my 39th, I was coming on my 40th, 40th birthday, my wife Levelyn asked me what did I want for my birthday. I said, honey, all I want is my journal. I want to go to Ocean City. I want to go to the ocean. I want to be alone with God. I want to process my life because I felt stuck in a very bad story. I felt like my story, you know, there's many genres of story. I felt like I had a lot of mystery because I was really lost in terms of my identity. So that was an issue. I didn't know my identity in Christ. I was also uh, stuck in a lot of drama because I blamed my past. I blamed my mom and dad's divorce. I blamed Leslie. I blamed everyone. I was not owning my life. So I was stuck in a bad story. Stuck in a bad story. And I had, these, I had depression. I had panic attacks. I could not get on a plane and, uh, without having a panic attack. 
Now, if you've never had a panic attack, then you don't know what I'm talking about. You, you have no idea what this is about. Uh, but uh, it's that sense that you're closed in, you're claustrophobic, and you feel like you can't breathe, you feel like you're going to die. And it feels like, I see some of you nodding. It's, it, it, it can be like a minute, minute and a half, but it feels like an eternity, and it is horrible. It's a horrible feeling. And so that began to surface for me, and, and it di- tied cur- directly into these areas that we're talking about in terms of perms, who I, what was going on emotionally and relationally in my life. Like going to a theater, we all have a front stage and a backstage. And on the front stage of our lives, we, we, we have, it's, it's, it's the public side of who we are. It's your public story. Okay, it's, it's, it's the performance, it's how you, you and I show up, it's our appearance, it's achievement, it's our actions, it's relationships, it's the doing part of who we are, it's the front stage, it's the public story, it's the front stage. But then we have a backstage at a theater. And backstage behind the curtains is preparation. Backstage, metaphorically, in your life and my life, it's the intent. It's your motive. It's your identity. It's vulnerabilities. It's your heart. It's your soul. It's your truest self. Now, I'm a kid from New York. I'm just a kid from Queens and Brooklyn, New York. And Manhattan, the other borough, is where all the action is. Times Square, Wall Street. Well, your heart is a lot like that. The biblical heart, the Hebrew heart in the Word of God, it's where all the action is. It's the internal headquarters. That's why scripture says this, over a thousand times, God's Word refers to our heart and our soul. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart, an imperative. Guard your heart with what? All diligence, hard work, heart work. For out of it flow the issues of life. Guard your heart backstage, for out of it on the front, front stage flow the issues of life. It's your relationships. It's your, it's your body. It's all the issues, your finances. It's all the, your career. It's all the issues of life. But it happens backstage. Man looks on the outward appearance, front stage. God looks at your heart backstage, okay? Uh, the love chapter, though I speak with the tongues of men, backstage and have not love, front stage, I'm a noisy gong, I'm a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and under, understand all mysteries and have all faith and all knowledge, backstage, but have not love, front stage, I am nothing. Though I give my gifts to feed the poor and live my body to be burned, back, front stage, but have not love, backstage, I am nothing. And everything else Paul says from from verses 4 through 8 are all backstage. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. All backstage all backstage. So as we go through these five areas, we're going to be looking and contrasting that front stage, backstage, and how that all works in living healthy in a stressful world. So we're going to look at several scriptures as we go through. So let's get up, seatbelt on, here we go. Let's look at first the P, physical. The P, physical. How am I treating my body? How am I treating my body? How am I treating my body? Now I teach at Johns Hopkins University. I'm an adjunct professor there, and I teach what's called positive psychology. Uh, Positive psychology is a scientific, evidence-based approach to how people thrive and flourish. So most of us have not heard of that field, but you've seen some of the concepts and constructs from the field, words like happiness and grit, optimism, resilience, um, words like this, gratitude. These are all biblical words, flourishing. These are all biblical words. And I can't say this at Johns Hopkins, I'll get fired probably, but I'm tempted to say this. It's amazing to me when research says amen to scripture. Because when you look at all these constructs of grit and gratitude and optimism and resilience and flourishing, these are biblical words and when you apply them to your life, it's amazing how your life snap, crackles and pops. It's amazing. 
And so that's true even with your body. You have in your brain, when you exercise your body, you have endorphins that come alive and it helps to bring a sense of, 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 of happiness and, and pleasure uh, because it resonates with what's endorphins and dopamine and serotonin and all the pleasure centers in your brain. Well, God put that there. But you gotta, we got to move our bodies. How am I treating my body? That our bodies are an instrument, not an ornament. And if we're not careful, it, our bodies can go from an instrument, if we're not careful, to a detriment. How are you resting your body? How are you feeding your body? At, in my 30s, I can get by on two, three hours of sleep. Every now and then, eat pizza at 1.30 in the morning. Okay? At 56, I take naps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I take a power nap every time. I never pass up an opportunity to take a good nap. I take a power nap. All I need is about 15 minutes, and I'm good. It's my five-hour energy drink, and I just give me a power nap, and I'm good. I take naps. Yeah. And so what are you doing with your body? What are you doing with your body? First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 says this, For physical training is of some value. Okay, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Okay, and it's a comparative verse. He's simply saying the physical, uh, you're not going to take all that with you, but while you're here, um, make good use of it, attend to it, you know, attend to your body. But he says the spiritual you have for this, has promised for this life and the life to come. So what are you doing with your body? What are you doing with your body? See, Jesus in his day, they didn't have LA Fitness and Planet Fitness and all these fitness places to go. They didn't need to. They worked, they did farm work, they walked everywhere they went, they got on a mule, they boat, they ate fish, their diet was Mediterranean. And so they were pretty healthy. They walked everywhere. Okay? They didn't have a metro or a bus to catch to get to the next town. And so they walked or they got on a mule. What are you doing? First Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We're not our own. Several months ago, I was having some abdominal stomach issues. So I went in for, to get checked up. And so my doctor had me do several tests. The next day they called me and says, hey, we need you to get an MRI. So they said, we think we see a small mass on your pancreas. Not words you want to hear. So I get the MRI, and I'm telling you, for a week, Leather and I were having a lot of intense conversations. Like, what is going on? And then I get a call about, hey, did you hear about so-and-so, a friend of ours from college named Virgil? I said, no. I said, you know, his funeral was today. They said he died of colon cancer. Now, my results came back. There was nothing found. We praise God for that. But I found out about my friend Virgil from college that he never had a colonoscopy. He, and, and so he's 59 years old, six kids he left behind, that he never had a colonoscopy. And that angered me because I said, that was preventable. That was preventable. What are you doing with your body? Living healthy happens intentionally, not automatically. And then emotionally. What's happening in your emotions? How are you? How am I managing my emotions? Listen to David's writing in Psalm 42.5. Why am I discouraged? He's speaking to himself. Why am I restless? I trust you, and I will praise you again because you help me. Look at Jesus in Matthew 26, verses 37 through, 37 through 39. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Listen to the emotions. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, speaking to himself, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He's speaking to himself, and he's speaking to his disciples. What do you do with your emotions? And I love this about Jesus and David because these are men's men. This, these, are, these, are, these are men that, the, the, this is Jesus, right? Let's not be more spiritual than Jesus. 
If Jesus can go there with his emotions, especially to guys, because the only emotion that most men will identify is anger. We can feel sad, we can feel afraid, we can feel stressed, but we'll never say those emotions. We'll say, I'm angry. I'm angry. Jesus and David, they, they, are, they are pros at examining their emotions. They understand their emotional neighborhoods, which all of us have to understand our emotional neighborhoods. I got to know when I'm on Anger Avenue or Anxiety Avenue or Bitterness Boulevard or Confused Court or Depression Drive or Lonely Lane or Pity Place or Resentment Road or Tired Terrace or Worried Way. And the sin is not when we go in those emotional neighborhoods. It's when we go in there, park the car, build the house, and hang out there. See, whenever we don't talk out, we act out. Or we bury it, the emotion, but we bury it alive. Even business understands this. Corporate world understands this. I do a lot of what's called EQ, emotional intelligence training. And with that, over 90% of your success in business and in life and in relationships is based on your ability to be emotionally intelligent. David models this for us. Jesus models this for us. How are you doing with it? How are you managing stress, anger? Where are you as it relates to burnout in your life? Do you know the signs of burnout in your life? Signs such as when you find yourself easily angered, that's probably a sign. When you find yourself no longer laughing, that's probably an indicator. When you find yourself living every day with a sense of when, W-H-E-N, when I get, then I'll be. When I get married, then I'll be happy. When I get out of this marriage, then I'll be happy. When I, get mar when I have kids, then I'll be happy. When the kids grow up and leave, then I'll be happy. When I get a house, then I'll be happy. When I get a new house, then I'll be happy. When I get a job, I'll be happy. When I get a new, a different job, then I will be happy. It's this when, then thinking, and if you notice, there's always another win. How are you showing up emotionally? What's going on for you emotionally? One of the things that I do to help me process emotionally is I keep a journal of my thoughts and my ideas and gratitude. I'll say more about this a little later. But... Um, that's one of the things that, that have helped me over the years. But, but also, what are you doing with emotions and as it relates to forgiving? And you're stuck on resentment road. You're stuck on pity place. See, a sponge, this sponge is dry right now, but you can imagine if it, was absor if it has absorbed a lot of water. Like our hearts, if I just set this sponge aside, several things happen. The sponge becomes hardened. Brittle. The sponge, oftentimes a stench emanates from the sponge, okay? Or before the sponge gets hardened and is fresh with a lot of water, representing a lot of hurt or emotional injury in our lives, it can just drip, drip, drip with cynicism. Everything that comes out of my mouth is negative. So then, this, this, so then you know, our lives, we become an odor, not a fragrance in relationships. And so, the same is true of our hearts. And so how do we deal with the sponge? So, so what happens is this, what God wants is this, like our heart's like a sponge. When the heart has absorbed a lot of emotional injury and pain, emotionally speaking, God would want us to in, engage the heart, wrestle with God, pour out our hearts as, as David and Jesus do, be able to go before him as Psalm 62, 62 8 says, pour out your heart before me. Engaging your heart is like wringing out the sponge. I have to, in order for the sponge to be useful again, 
I have to engage it and squeeze in order for the sponge to let out the water. And that's, like, that's the forgiveness process. We can be honest with God about the emotional injury, about the hurt in our lives, but I have to engage the sponge. And oftentimes, depending on the severity of the wound or the emotional injury, it's going to take a lot more time and processing and talking and forgiving and wringing out the sponge and continuing to forgive. Writing a letter to that person, but it's not for them, and you don't send it to them necessarily, it's for you, because you discover that there's a prisoner inside, and that prisoner is you. And with, like a sponge, and like our hearts, when we do this work, hard work, hard work of squeezing a sponge and dealing with our hearts, this sponge has room to be used again. Your heart has room to begin again. Your heart has room to love again. Living healthy happens intentionally, not automatically. So what's happening relationally? How am I showing up? How are we showing up in our relationships? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says this, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe, woe, woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. So remember that slide that talked about the front stage, backstage. So like going to a theater play. On the front stage, or the backstage rather, you better have some support cast. It's the place of preparation. Now, backstage, relationally speaking, God gets an all-access pass to your backstage. If God's in your life, then he needs to get an all-access pass to your backstage. But guess what? You also better have a few, like the Marines commercial, a few good men, a few good women that you allow access to your backstage. People who've earned the right to go backstage, because most of your relationships are going to be front stage out here. But there's a few people who get the right to go back here. Everyone doesn't get the right to go back here, but you better have a few. And that's what made me sick. That's where sickness, emotional sickness happened in my life, and spiritual sickness, because I did not trust anyone to go back there. I'm embarrassed to say, my wife and I have been married 29 years. I'm not embarrassed to say that, but I'm embarrassed to say, Early in our marriage, early in our marital story, I refused. I was uncomfortable. I was scared to allow Leslie access back here. I was scared to lift up the window shade to my heart and allow her to peek in because I was afraid, would she shame me? If she saw my insecurities, if she saw my struggles, if she saw my vulnerabilities, if she, would she laugh at some of the dreams that I had? What, 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 it was that sense. It was like, you know, we, we dated and we were, we were friends, but it was like it was another level of glory, another level of trust, and I wasn't quite ready to let her go back there. She wanted to. And I, and I really wasn't quite ready for really anyone to go back there. And so God began dealing with me, Johnny, it's one thing for me to be back here, but it's not good for you to be alone. You have me. To be well, son, you got to have honesty, transparency, vulnerability with me, with yourself, and with safe people, a support cast. Because quite frankly, men and women, we can't know ourselves, grow ourselves by ourselves. Let me say that again. You and I, we can't know ourselves, grow ourselves by ourselves. We need a support cast. I love what you do here at South Point, that you have communities and you have small groups. Those are necessary for your wellness, for your health, for you to flourish. You can't do this life alone. And it, I paid the price for only, you know, being back there in the dark by myself, feeling isolated. Today, I have several people not many, because many have not earned the right to go backstage. But my wife is in my backstage. I had to learn how to share with us, sweetheart, I need you to travel with me because I'm afraid I'm going to lose control on the plane one day. Okay? 
And I'm having these panic attacks. She had no idea. But the moment I began to talk about that, see, what, hap what happens is this. Whatever we don't talk out, we act out, or we bury it, and we bury it alive. And that's what was going on. So follow me. We have life. We have stress. We have adversities. We have challenges. No community, no support cast, no backstage relationships equals dysfunction. Did you get that? Depression, a lot of things. Okay, let me do that again. So we have life. We have stress, we have adversities and challenges. We have no community, no, no people backstage, no support cast equals dysfunction. Now follow this. We have life. We have stress, adversities, and challenges. We have a support cast. We have a small group. We have community. That equals health. That equals flourishing. Did you get that? Do it again. So we have life. We have stress, adversities, and challenges. We have community. We have small group. We have a support cast equals health, equals hope, equals flourishing. This is how Papa God designed us. Who's in your support cast? Who, who have you allowed access to your backstage? Who, who's allowed to go behind the curtain? Yeah, I get it. Jesus is back there, but God is saying to you, you know what? You need a few good men, a few good women that go back here, that see, you, see your true self, to see who you really are. People who love you, but they're not overly impressed with you. But they've earned the right to go backstage. Now, if you're married, you already have one person that does that. He loves you, she loves you, but they're not impressed with you. <laughs> and you need that, because you need to be able to speak truth to power. And then, what about your mental life? Your mental life. What's happening in your thought life? Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. But then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So basically, he says meditate in day and night. That simply means all the time. <laughs> like, it's, it's just a lifestyle. You go to the bath, you take a shower, you, you, you're driving a car. You ought to be having a scripture that you're meditating on all the time. Pray God's word back to God. Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable. Skip down to the, the last part of that verse. He says, dwell on those things. See, we're, we're, we have to watch our thoughts because our thoughts affect our emotions. We got to watch our emotions because our emotions affect our be behavior. We got to watch our behavior because our behavior affects our character. We got to watch our character because our character influences our destiny. So what are you doing? What's happening in your thought life? See, living healthy happens intentionally, not automatically. Not automatically. And then finally, your spiritual life. What's the condition of your soul? When's the last time someone asked you that question? What's the, what's the condition of your soul? Psalm 62, 1. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. So where does our soul find rest? Your soul does not find rest in a human being. Your soul does not find rest in your spouse. Your soul does not find rest having a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Your soul does not find rest in how many likes you get on Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat or, or, or you know, Facebook. Your soul does not find rest in any of those things. Your soul was made to find rest in him alone. So, so where does your soul go to catch its breath? How do you have stillness in your life? Where does your soul go to catch its breath? Where does your soul go? Here's, here's another way to think about this. So I have this garbage can, but I have this cup, represents you and me. And a pitcher of water represents God. He's life, he's water. And what happens for many of us, we can get a good, be filled on a Sunday, and okay, so we're filled. And then we start our week. So I, I invest in who I am spiritually, so I go to worship, and I, I worship, and, and, I, and, I, and I do those things in intimacy with God, impacting with people, so I pour out a whole lot there. And then my body, I, I, it, my body takes, you know, takes up energy, and I pour out a lot with my body. I may exercise, may not exercise, uh, how I eat, or how, you know, what's happening physically, so I pour out there. 
I got emotions, so I'm stressed, I'm not stressed, or how am I doing with my emotions, so the stuff going out there. I'm in relationships with people, and so I got kids, I'm single, I got a roommate, I got career, I got people at work, so I pour out there. Then it's my mindset. How do I keep my mind fresh? How do I deal with my thoughts that's going through my mind and the stories that I'm telling myself mentally? So next thing I know, I'm poured out. I'm upside down. This is not the way you and I were created. Jesus said, I came that you might have life, have it more abundantly. God says, let me fill you up. And so as you go, you pour out. But you come back and I pour back into you. As you go, you pour out. And you pour in spiritually. You pour in physically. You exercise the rest of your body. You pour in emotionally. You deal some gratitudes. You pour in and pour out. Pour in, pour out. Pour in, pour out. So that you're never, that you are this well-watered spring. Bringing forth water and life continually. And one of the practical ways, again, that I've done this over the years and help me to live a healthier life is to keep a gratitude journal. We have these out there in the lobby to purchase. And, um, and so it's just a way to write a letter to Papa God, dear God, and just identify three to five gratitudes each day, th three things that you're grateful for. And what happens, the science behind this, God's word says in 1, Timothy, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in all things give thanks. And so what happens is this. When you and I are intentional about gratitude, and it's got to be pen to paper, not, you know, not on your phone, even though I, I, you know, I'll be glad no matter how you do it, but it's, it goes deeper. When you write pen to paper, it resonates with your brain. And the studies show that when you journal gratitude and you write it down, that it, it, it makes your brain come alive and dopamine and serotonin, which is the pleasure centers in your brain. So I challenge you, start doing something like this, keeping a, a gratitude journal. Or well, the other thing has been, my wife and I have a vision board in our, in our bedroom on the back of our bathroom door. And we have perms spelled out. And we have pictures and we have scriptures. And we look at that thing like every day. And we'll make a pledge to Papa God. We'll just pledge, like, you know, growing up, there was, you had to listen to the Pledge of Allegiance every day to the flag, and we'd make a pledge to God. Papa God, we pledge to love you with all our soul, heart, and mind today. We pledge with our bodies to, to treat our bodies and to honor you with our bodies, that we are bought with the price, that we are, with, today we will glorify you with our body, how we exercise it, how we feed it, how we rest it. Emotionally, Papa God, we pledge to, to, to be people of generosity. We pledge to walk in your spirit and be, live out the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, patience, self-control, long-suffering. We pledge today, relationally, to do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, esteeming others as better than ourselves. We pledge mentally to keep our minds stayed on Christ as he keeps us in perfect peace. And that's just, what happens with that? We're leading our heart. We're writing that story from the backstage before we ever go front stage. And I want to challenge you. Consider something like that. Imagine what your life would look like. We have something visual or you're writing and you're writing your life, and you're not existing, but you're really living. So yes, living healthy is hard work. And living healthy is hard work. And living healthy is worth the work. And with Papa God, you and I can do the work. Let's pray. Papa God, thank you that this is the day that you've given us and we rejoice and we will be glad in it. And thank you that we are your sons and daughters, that we are crowned with glory and honor. And thank you that out of your unlimited riches, out of your unlimited riches, we experience the width, the length, the height and depth of your love for us. And today we rest in your unfailing love and all God's Sons and daughters said, Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. 
click the logo to subscribe.